It is the second story along these lines in recent days. The other was reporting that the Obama administration halted something called Operation Cassandra, designed to stop Hezbollah drug operations. So why would they have done either, as these reports suggest? The theory in both is that the Obama White House was currying favor with the Iranian regime in order to get the Iran nuclear deal done. Trace Gallagher joins us tonight on the story with the backstory. Hey, Trace. Hey, Martha. General Qassam Soleimani is the commander of Iran's terrorist Quds Force. The Washington Times says the general is also responsible for the deaths of more than 500 U.S. soldiers in Iraq. The Kuwaiti newspaper Al Jarida now claims that three years ago, near Damascus, Israel was on the verge of assassinating General Qassam, but the administration, the Obama administration, warned Iran and thwarted the operation. In an effort to confirm the story, New York Times columnist Brett Stevens sent out a tweet tagging Ben Rowe. He's the former deputy national security advisor under Obama. Rhodes didn't respond, but former National Security Council spokesman Tommy Veter did, sarcastically writing, quote, yeah, WTF, Ben, immediately confirm or deny this totally unsubstantiated claim and then tell us why you don't support assassinations. Brett Stevens then responded that the Obama administration certainly didn't object to assassinating other terrorists like Osama bin Laden. And that led to this back and forth. First, Veter saying, quote, yeah, taking out Osama bin Laden is the same as assassinating an Iranian political leader. Stevens comes back with this. Seriously, Tommy Veter, Soleimani is an Iranian political leader. Actually, he's head of Quds Force, which is a U.S. designated sponsor of terrorism. Veter responds, writing, quote, He's a military leader, Quds Force commander, major political figure in their system, and a general piece of blank. But to blithely suggest the U.S. should support his assassination, is irresponsible. Then Tommy Veter sends another tweet that appears to confirm that the Obama administration did warn Iran, saying, quote, we were well aware of the dangers posed by Qasem Soleimani and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Obama sanctioned them repeatedly, among other deterrents, but an assassination of Soleimani by Israel would be destabilizing, to put it mildly. When Brett Stevens asked if that was confirmation, there was a bit of mild name-calling. Finally, Ben Rhodes weighed in, accusing the New York Times of propagating garbage. And finally, we should note, the Kuwaiti newspaper is also reporting the U.S. has now given Israel the green light to assassinate General Soleimani. The White House has not commented. Martha. Trace, thank you very much. So Mark Thiessen, who you see here often on the story, got in the middle of this buzzsaw when he chimed in on it today. He's an American Enterprise Institute scholar and former chief speechwriter for, the president, for President George W. Bush. He's also a Fox News contributor. Um, Mark, why did this, this incite you? Why, you know, why did this make you want to dive into the middle of this and give your own opinion? Well, just because this is this is just shows the the blight attitude that the Obama administration had towards terrorism. I mean, you, you this is the same guy who went on uh, Brett Baer's show and said, "Dude, that was like three years ago when uh, when it had to do with the." You know what? Uh, Since you mentioned it, um, <laughs> let, let's show that because I, I don't think a lot of people remember who Tommy Vitor is, and he's sure. the person whose tweets we just showed. So here here's that piece uh, with Brett Baer a while back. Did you also change attacks to demonstrations in the talking points? Uh, maybe I don't really remember. You don't remember. Dude, this was like two years ago. We're still talking about the dude, most mundane it is the thing process that everybody of, is the, talking about. Dude, so dude is still chiming dude. in uh, and and getting himself in the middle of this, despite the fact yeah. that he was not in the administration at the time, right? Yeah, no, but Ben Rhodes didn't uh, didn't uh, didn't confirm it either. I mean, look, dude, this is Kasim Soleimani is a terrorist. You know, he he tweeted one of those tweets that uh, that Trace just showed. He said that he called him an Iranian political leader. He's not an Iranian political leader. He's Iran's Osama bin Laden. This is the guy who runs the Quds Force, which is their premier terrorist organization that funds all of their terrorist proxies around the world. This is the, the, the this guy is the one who is who is running the Shia militias Iraq during the uh, during the Iraq War, providing them with advanced Iranian uh, roadside bombs, armor-piercing bombs that killed thousands and injured thousands of American soldiers, including uh, Sergeant Bennett, who, uh, who's going to be on shortly. I mean, th this is a guy, he, he blew up a, a, a Jewish cultural center in, a, in Argentina. This is the guy who was running, was running the operation. They were going to assassinate the Saudi ambassador by blowing him up in a restaurant in Washington, D.C., an attack that could have killed hundreds of Americans. This isn't some political leader. This is a 
this is a terrorist. He has more American blood on his hands than probably any living terrorist except for maybe Zawahiri and al-Qaeda. Uh, so getting rid of him wouldn't have been destabilizing, as Vitor said. It would have been made the world a better place. Yeah. I, I mean, is it accurate to say that, you know, when you see the chance of death to America in the streets of Tehran and other cities in Iran, um, this is the man who carries that out? Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, the Quds Force is, you know, the Quds Force that he runs. These people were behind the Kobar Towers bombing in 1996 that killed a bunch of Americans in Saudi Arabia. They were the ones who trained al-Qaeda and how to blow up buildings so they brought down the when they brought down the U.S. embassies in East Africa. Uh, he, they were providing, the Quds Force was providing uh, a sanctuary for al-Qaeda leaders in Iran. And the Obama administration themselves said that there's been, a, on, on their watch, there was a market increase in, in terrorism by the Iranians, uh, by the Quds Force. So, you know, so, I, I mean, but, but Ben Rhodes has said, you know, that this is not true, that, that they didn't do this, that they didn't tip mm -hmm. anyone off uh, to the fact that the Israelis wanted to assassinate him. They've also pushed back on the Cassandra Project story. They say it is not true that they basically took the gas pedal off when it came to the Project Cassandra effort because they, you know, the Hezbollah drug running and money raising effort for their military operations. Um, they say both of those things are not true. Does anything about what we learned today or the stories that we've read on this so far indicate that that's not the case or indicate what their mindset was on these things? Well, in the case of Project Cassandra, there's a 14,000-word piece in Politico that says otherwise. Uh, so they have to explain that they have some explaining to do in terms of responding to the people who went on the uh, who went on both on and off the record who who informed Politico about that. On this piece, let's let's. I mean, this is worthy of investigation. I mean, remember how upset the left was when Donald Trump reportedly accidentally shared Israeli intelligence with the Russians about an ISIS attack? If this is true, uh, then what this means is that the president of the United States intentionally shared. Israeli intelligence with the Iranians to protect a terrorist. That is a very, very serious charge, and at the very base, at the very minimum, it, re it requires investigation and, and, and looking into it to see if there's any truth to it. And we all remember how Ben Rhodes basically bragged about how he would create an echo chamber uh, to advocate for the Iranian deal, and that he enlisted like-minded policy groups and journalists to say, quote, things that validated what we had given them to say. Um, so, you know, we'll watch this. We'll watch this reporting and we'll watch this back and forth and see if there is more to substantiate it in the future. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. Thanks, Always Martha. Good to see you. Good to see you. So as Mark just pointed out, the terror of Qasem Soleimani and his Quds Force was an everyday reality to our troops on the ground in Iraq. It is believed that as many as one third of our casualties were a result of Iranian bombs and weaponry thrust into the Iraq conflict in order to kill and injure as many U.S. military mem members as possible. That's why the suggestion that the U.S. would do anything to aid them is gut-wrenching. My next guest is an Iraq war veteran who in 2005 was severely injured outside Baghdad by an EFP, which is a signature Iranian explosive. And now retired Staff Sergeant Robert Bartlett is an advisor to a group called United Against Nuclear Iran. He's joined tonight by Y.J. Fisher, a former State Department diplomat under President Obama who helped implement the Iran nuclear agreement. Welcome to both of you. It's great to have both of you uh, with us tonight. You know, we're sort of going back in history, looking at what was going on then and what enabled this group to continue to grow and continue to carry out their terrorism and attack our own military on the ground. Um, Sergeant Bartlett, when you listen to this back and forth, what do you think? What goes through, what goes through your mind? A uh, total betrayal of uh, everybody who served for this country and the country itself and its people. I uh, hear uh, Soleimani, that's all he wants to do is kill Americans, kill Israelis. So for us to give any kind of enablement to that country and that regime, current, that current regime is just um, treason. I, I got no other word. I, you know, I hate to use it, but uh, I can't see it any other way. It's treason. If I did anything relatively close to that, I would be held for treason and I'd be in Leavenworth. YJ, you worked on the Iranian nuclear agreement. Uh, when you listen to this discussion, does, does any of it ring true for you? No, not at all. You know, Tommy Veter is a very smart guy, but he's also a very funny guy. And I thought his tweet was pretty funny. I mean, how do you respond to something this outrageous? Of course, the Obama administration did not aid Iranian officials and pass Israeli intelligence. 
You know, I think Mark put it well. The only known instance of a U.S. government official ever burning Israeli intelligence was when Donald Trump passed Israeli intelligence about a covert anti-ISIS operation to the Russians. I mean, this so, claim you know, let me ask you that this. we are talking... I, I understand what you're saying. Let me ask you this. In terms of, of any potential plot to take out Soleimani, uh, which the Israeli papers are now reporting is the policy, that that would be allowed, that the United States would not, states would not stand in the way of that if the Israeli um, forces were able to pull that off. W would you be in favor of that policy? Absolutely. Hossam Soleimani is an absolute threat to the United States. And that is part of why, under the Obama administration, there was a real effort to impose intense sanctions on him and to the do billions what, of dollars. Push, push billions of dollars going to him? Come on. Billions of dollars, and you're saying, yeah, you increase the sanctions? Are you kidding me? The Iran nuclear deal? You've you got to be would... kidding me. I would say if you look at the recent protests, one of the things they show is that the Obama administration actually negotiated a much better nuclear agreement than its critics argue, right? I mean, if you look at the Iranian regime, it is weak and brittle, not empowered as its critics said it would be. If you look at the Iranian regime in the region, it is overextended, not flush with cash. It has I mean, also, one of the though, things it that it the has show also supported uh, the Assad regime supported their attack on their own people in many cases, and, and also reportedly continues to support the regime in, in North Korea. So they do have billions of dollars. Uh, they're not funneling it to their own people in the form of economic growth. And one of the things that their people are so upset about is that they're funneling it into these other terrorist operations in other countries. That's exactly right. But one of the things critics alleged about the nuclear deal was that it was going to give them more money to do these things. There is no doubt that the Iranian government is mucking around in the region doing terrible things, a threat to the United States. They are bad actors. But the nuclear agreement never gave them the kind of wealth that people were worried about. They were never flush with cash to extend their operations in the region. One of the things that we've seen is they are overextended and their population is angry about that. Sergeant Bartlett, do you agree? Uh, no, I, I totally disagree. I think uh, the Iran nuclear deal was a setup so they could push the billions over in the middle of the night in cash, and then there's no trace of where that cash can go because you can't trace it and the, the, the different currencies it was in. And so they can actually use it and buy the uh, nuclear weapon directly from North Korea, supercharge their nuclear program, so both, both countries who hate the U.S. would have the weapon, and then in 30 days, uh, the, Iran will have a nuclear bomb. And they'd be a trained force to use it. It takes 30 days. And that's a, that, that's a nuclear physicist who took, gave me that information. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous to say it didn't pave the way. YJ, in terms of the Cassandra project, the, DA, the Department of Justice has just begun a, a project to look into that, to figure out what happened there, and to continue to do what we can to end the activities of the drug running and drug business that fuels so much terrorism in the Middle East. Um, was there ever any effort from what you saw to say in any way, shape or form during during the perpetuation of the Iran nuclear deal? You know, we need to have separation between these two things. We know that they're guilty of massive terrorist activities across the Middle East, but we want separation in terms of hammering out this deal. Absolutely not. I mean, again, I go back to the point that if you look at the recent protests, I understand the point being made, but if you look at the recent protests, what is clear is that the Iranian government is not flush with cash. They don't have lots of money. The nuclear agreement was not, you know, if we take a step back, the real allegation here is that the Obama administration was coddling the Iran regime. And there's just no evidence that's true. And in fact, the protests show that the nuclear agreement was a hard-nosed agreement. I never sat in a single meeting in the White House situ situation room with Secretary Kerry with anyone where anyone ever tried to mention the nuclear agreement and those negotiations as being a reason why we weren't going to be just as tough on the Iran regime. All right, YJ uh, and Sergeant Bartlett, I'm going to give you the final word, uh, Sergeant Bartlett because you lost a lot thanks to an Iranian EED. It's, it's not just me who lost a lot. My buddy right next to me was, was killed instantly, and I've got to do this for him. He's not here. He doesn't have, he's not with his daughters anymore. And so if I'm not standing up and giving him a voice, then who is, right? So you can't say that Obama administration was friends with Israel and do what they did with the Iran nuclear deal and then say, hey, you know what? We're not really cozying up to Iran, but we're going to give them billions of dollars in the middle of the night because we think, oh, they're going to win some court case. It's a load. It's a total load, and the people of the United States know it. And you got, the, the reality is, is people got caught. 
And that's what's happened. It just happened a little earlier this time. We're going to stay on it. I'm just glad it. that the truth came out. We're, we're going to stay on it. Um, and there are a number of uh, forces that are working these stories, and we'll continue to see where they go. Uh, YJ, thank, thank you very you, much. Sergeant Bartlett, always a pleasure thank you to again. see you both. Appreciate thank you, both. you. You bet. So things got pretty heated in Washington today in the ongoing fight over immigration. And late tonight, what the president said about certain countries has ignited a major firestorm. But he wasn't the only one to stir the pot. The five white guys, I call them, you know. Um, <laughs> I said, they you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? Congressman Sean Duffy and Juan Williams react to both controversies and where we're going from here right after this on The Story. Right now, we're counting on Republicans and Democrats to come together, which we think they will, uh, to make a deal on DACA and on border security. Pace was quick today on the Hill and at the White House. The president wants an immigration deal. Senator Lindsey Graham says it has to be done in tandem with next Friday's cutoff to fund the government. Or he believes, you heard him last night here on The Story, that it won't happen. The vice president told us yesterday that it could wait until after the funding deal and deal with the March 5th cutoff for DACA. So reports are that uh, at the White House, you may have heard, got a little heated in the Oval Office. Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry is live at the White House with the very latest on the president's comment tonight. Hi, Ed. Martha, great to see you breaking tonight. Fox News has confirmed that in an Oval Office meeting today on immigration, the president used an expletive to lash out at immigrants coming in from African countries and Haiti. This was a smaller group of key lawmakers following up on yesterday's big bipartisan meeting on the same subject. We're told the president got upset that some lawmakers were saying that as part of a broader deal, they wanted to restore protections for immigrants from countries like El Salvador, various African countries, Haiti as well. As first reported by the Washington Post, the president declared, why are we having all these people from bleephole countries come here? Instead, the president said the lawmakers should be focused on bringing in more immigrants from nations like Norway, front of mind, because remember, he was holding meetings with that country's prime minister yesterday, and no surprise, this is a president who speaks his mind bluntly, especially on an issue that animated his presidential campaign. But White House spokesman Raj Shah did not deny the comments, instead saying the president wants a merit-based system and, quote, certain Washington politicians choose to fight for foreign countries, but President Trump will always fight for the American people. The comments today came at a meeting that included two key senators on the matter, Democrat Dick Durbin, Republican Lindsey Graham, who are working on a deal that would include ending the visa lottery program and then taking some of those 50,000 visas to protect people from places like Haiti who have been living in America under what is known as temporary protected status. Other problems may spike this proposed DACA deal anyway. It gives protected status to the so-called dreamers to satisfy moderates like Senator Jeff Flake, but conservatives point out this is a no-go without funding for an actual wall instead of a small payment of general border security. Watch. We have a, an agreement that we're, the bipartisan group I'm talking about, the mm -hmm. six of us working, that we're shopping among our colleagues now. Now, we don't want to release details until we talk to more of our colleagues. They have got to come off their unreasonable view that is DACA or nothing. It's not happening. We've got to secure a border. We've got to end chain migration, the visa lottery, and have these other fixes in place. We should note that House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi also made some controversial comments of her own today on immigration, lashing out at the fact that, in her words, the talks are led by five white guys, which sounds like the five guys fast food chain. Watch. The five white guys, I call them, you know. Um, <laughs> I said, are you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? Well, one of those white guys is Pelosi's number two, Congressman Steny Hoyer, a Democrat who rebuked her for what he called an offensive comment, a sign that this already volatile debate is getting more inflamed, Martha. Ed, thank you very much. Here now, Wisconsin Congressman Sean Duffy and co-host of The Five, Juan Williams. He is also a Fox News political analyst. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Um, the president took a few steps forward in all of this the other day with the meeting that he had. Um, perhaps it would be wise to keep a camera in there all the time. Maybe that would keep the language sort of uh, on, on, on track, but this is not helpful. Listen, this is not help at all. It's a distraction. But i got to tell you, what, it's, it's not going to distract us from the mission that we actually want to get uh, a solution for the DACA kids we want to secure a border. We want to end chain migration. And we want to end the lottery system. And, and we do think there's a deal here. But you heard this conversation that's taking place with these, this self-appointed group of uh, Republicans and Democrats. 
I would argue that the information I've heard from the deal, that's not going to get through a Republican Senate or a Republican House. This is a crappy deal uh, that I don't think anyone will buy into. It doesn't accomplish the goals that the president ran on. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think the president meant with that comment? And what do you think, how do you think he should have put it if he was trying to express that? I don't know. I, listen, I can't put myself in the, in the president's head. I, it's an unfortunate comment. Uh, it, it's a, um, listen, it's, I, I can't defend it. Um, I don't think anybody can. I don't, I don't know where he wanted to go with it. Um, so I, I don't know, Martha. I don't, have, I don't have good insight. And it's a really hard spot to sit tonight to try to defend or analyze what he was trying to mean because it's offensive. I don't like it. You know, I always try to understand what politicians are trying to do. So at best, you could say he was trying to talk about the diversity of the lottery, uh, which is, you know, part of his objection right now is that we have a lottery that, that spe specifically targets people from countries that aren't equally represented in terms of the immigrant flow coming into the United States. And he's saying, ah, oh, we don't need that. But his language, as the congressman said, I think it's deeply offensive. Remember, Donald Trump's family came from a place that once would have been described in those terms by the elites of that time. So it's a, and then secondly, there's the racial angle, because then he says, oh, maybe we need more people from Norway. I don't think there's any getting away from the color of people from Norway as opposed to people coming from Haiti, Africa, uh, El Salvador. You so, know, he uh, has said, and I, I'm, not, I'm not making any excuses for him, but he has said in the past, you know, that, that we want to bring in people who have the skills for the jobs that we need here. Um, we have a lot of low-skilled workers in this country. Uh, you know, having them get getting the jobs for them is the priority. Um, many countries do at times restrict immigration from certain areas because they want to change the the flow of where people are coming from. Right? Um, you know, that that that's what I was sort of asking you. I mean, you know, is there a legitimate argument to be made for saying? We need to cut off immigration from certain countries, and we need to encourage it from others. That is not a racial question, but that's a question of skills, well, well, skill set. Then, well, then it's not by country. I think it's give us your best and your brightest, your right. hardest working people. Well, that's I don't what care he, where he you said come that from. in the past. He and, did and not he say has. that articulately um, tonight, that's but, for sure. But, but, but that, that's exactly that. He didn't say that tonight, and I think it leaves a lot of room for speculation and claims of racism, and, and it doesn't advance the cause of our mission to secure the border. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, he I didn't talk that. about qualified people here. He said blank countries in a way that I think suggests that anybody coming from such a country is not worth That's not I mean, I don't think that's what he should be saying. Let me just say that. That's not what I expect from the American president. We're a country that takes people who've been oppressed, people who have suffered natural disasters. And we turn them into Americans who produce great things. But, but I mean, but that's what this argument is all about. But but everyone agrees with that sentiment. But they have to come in legally, but, and you have to have that's rules fine, and regulations. But that's not what he said. About how Martha. they could, no, this, clearly it was not. This is a unique conversation on the five I was watching earlier. But uh, Donald Trump speaks like he might be sitting in a Wisconsin bar. Um, he doesn't use always the most refined language, and sometimes he's speaking freely and maybe off the cuff, and uh, it's language that can be misinterpreted. And the problem is when that language gets leaked out. He looks horrible. And so you got to ask, who's, who's sitting well, in the room with you? What about one last thought on Nancy and, and Pelosi's language comment? Because I think that was an offensive comment as well, that these five white guys, why do we always have to make these kinds of judgments about the people who are included in conversations? What difference would it make? Well, of course it makes so a difference. So you want the best people, yeah, whoever the... they are, regardless of color, to be talking about this issue? Sure, but also I think you have to understand that there was nobody in there who was of any Hispanic origin tied in any way to people who so are coming from that So they can't have any end. sensitivity or understanding. They, of course they can. Of course and they I think, can. And I think that's why they, the four guys, then said, you know, we'd like Senator Menendez, Robert Menendez of New Jersey, to come into the group because they want some perspective that's not simply a group of white men. But remember, it was well, a joke about the five guys. Well, but, I get it. But, 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 I just think it's but this isn't getting broken down uh, in racial lines. This is ideological lines. I mean, you have right. a hardcore fight with five white guys or six white hey, guys. The president and Lindsey Graham and right. talking about dealing not with racial. the situation with love yesterday. Right. Uh, the language is a little different now, as, we, as we've talked about. But but that he has expressed that sentiment many times. So I don't know why you have to be of a certain color or background no, to understand the situation. Well, I think it'd be think helpful to have somebody who's sensitive to the way that the language is written, especially for people who are recent immigrants and Hispanics are the ones who we're talking about here. But I think that the congressman's points well taken, too. There are lots of white guys. You know, I'm thinking Ann Coulter, Mark Levin, people on the strong conservative side who have objections to this. But yeah. not, what, what well, I care more about is not what race you are or what, or what sex you are. I care that you're an American and you're going to fight for American. Exactly. American we agree that's, on that. That's the key. Okay. All right. Thanks, you guys. Great to have Thanks you here tonight. Time. So this is from Carl Rove's op-ed in The Wall Street Journal. Quote, now listen to this. Long before the presidential election, the populist candidate's mental state was under attack. 
The New York Times ran a series over several days suggesting he was unfit for office. An anonymous psychiatrist diagnosed megalomania. So who was that about? What if we told you it was written 100 years ago? Carl Rove joins us with the answer next. It is 100% of the senior staff of this White House, the people dealing with him on a daily basis, who said, this is, um, this is unusual. It's unstable. This is, hmm. it's not just unstable, it's unpredictable, erratic. Right. Well, Meghan McCain went after him hard today. That was Fire and Fury author Michael Wolff. The president famously fired back the other day, quote, actually, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been my mental stability and being, like, really smart. He is set to have a physical at Walter Reed tomorrow. Here's what he said about that. How do you think the physical will go? I think it's going to go very well. <laughs> I'll be very surprised if it doesn't. So my next two guests say that many presidents and candidates have been raked over the coals for their mental acuity, their personality, their lifestyle, but usually long after they are gone from Pennsylvania Avenue. For instance, biographers say FDR used his daughter as a go-between for middle-of-the-night trysts with his mistress. JFK not only seduced a 19-year-old White House staffer, but asked her to perform favors for his friends as well. Where were the psychiatrists with press passes to diagnose those presidents, we ask? For now, more on that. Carl Rove, former deputy chief of staff to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. And Victor Davis Hanson uh, joins us uh, on the piece that he wrote about the president as well. Gentlemen, welcome. It is great to have both of Thank you uh, with us tonight. Carl, let me start with you because we, we teased mm. that really interesting intro to your piece today, um, which reminds us that there has been this kind of debate over presidents and presidential candidates very much in the past. Yeah, um, 121 years ago, in the closing days of the frantic 1896 campaign, the New York Times unlibered a three-story, four-day series on William Jennings Bryan that, that, that said he was insane. They used the term of the time for insane, matoid, and uh, they quoted anonymous sources and others on the record, all diagnosing uh, the candidate from a distance. Uh, he was delusional, a megalomaniac, a demagogue. Uh, obviously incapable of, uh, of serving as the leader of, uh, of the United States. So, look, this is routine. Let's, let's be honest about it. Virtually every modern president has had some kind of tell-all expose book written uh, generally early in their term, unsourced, single-sourced, anonymous, gossipy quotes, sensationalism. Uh, you may remember one that was published shortly after George W. Bush became president called Bush's Brain, uh, which suggested that he was an idiot and I was the guy who had the brain. <laughs> they, they, forgot that, they forgot that President Bush was a Yale history major and a Harvard MBA. He responded to, to it not by tweeting, but by sending me inner office mail, a, an elaborately wrapped package. And when I opened it up, it was a, a game of cranium with a presidential <laughs> seal on the outside, which is his way of saying, don't worry, don't I worry. get what they're trying to do. Yeah. Amazing. You know, Victor uh, Davis Hanson, you wrote this column basically that outlines some of the outrageous behavior of past presidents. They had the luxury of having it not documented during their time in office. And they did. I mean, can you imagine right now if Donald Trump was running a blood pressure reading of 245 over 135 while he was chain smoking and uh, having two or three martinis at night, as you said, and his daughter Ivanka was running clearance for an affair that he was conducting with a staffer. Uh, and this is not like drinking 12 uh, uh, Diet Cokes that we're told. So whether it's JFK or whether it was uh, Bill Clinton, we have we have a we have to get some historical perspective. And then, in an absolute and relative sense, crazy people don't uh, win or dest actually destroy a, a field of 16 really well-qualified well primary candidates. They don't beat the Clinton machine that was the most well-funded, well-connected, well-reported campaign in recent memory. And then they don't achieve two quarters of consecutive 3.2 economic growth or historically low unemployment or a high stock market or business confidence where it is or we're going to have record oil production 11 uh, million barrels next year we 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 calibrate the entire middle east just on energy efficiency alone so these are tangible achievements so what it's really about i think is an ongoing effort whether you like him or not to delegitimize the president of the united states it was remember we challenged the voting machines and then we said the electoral 
college was going to be challenged, and then we were told that their emolument clause was going to be invoked, and then there was an impeachment suit, and then there was talk of the 25th Amendment. So Trump the colluder, Trump the tax cheat, Trump the predator, now it's Trump the deranged president that somehow got nominated, somehow got elected, and somehow had some pretty impressive achievements in his first year. Interesting. It's a great piece. Um, you know, Carl, you praised the bipartisan meeting the other day. Um, but we know that we live in a world where there is uh, a leak a minute, basically. And tonight's came out of the meeting, the bipartisan meeting, where they were supposed to be getting together to put something on the table with regards to immigration. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, uh, the president sometimes is, is not his best friend. And uh, the remarks, uh, crude uh, and uh, dismissive remarks in that meeting are going to hurt him. But, but look, back, back for just a second on this book that, we're, that, that generated all this week. Yeah. I've re I, I was forced to read it for, before Fox News Sunday last, last weekend. And it's amazing to me how out of touch with what a president, being a president, is all about. My favorite chapter is Chapter 8, at great length. Wolf goes and excoriates the divisions among the West Wing staff. Chief of Staff Reince Priebus is insisting on working with the leadership in Congress in order to advance the agenda. Jared Kushner wants to reach out to business executives. And uh, Steve Bannon wants executive orders. And he closes off this chapter by saying, and President Trump doesn't seem to understand he can't have it all. Well, every president wants to do all three of those things. And it, it just showed to me the ignorance of, of Wolf when approaching the job of the president. And of course, yeah. every one of those people is going to try to carve out an yeah. agenda and they're going to try to push it with the president. And, and, you know, see how, how far they can get and how much they can accomplish. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your unique perspectives you. on the pieces that you wrote. You uh, interesting reading. Highly recommend it. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. You. So coming up here, huge news today from Walmart. Raises pretty much across the board. President Trump getting the credit. But is that the whole story? We're going to talk about it. Fox Business host Charles Payne joins us once again here on The Story with his story about what's really going on in America with the economy, with Walmart, with all these raises when we come back. Big news from Walmart today. The world's largest retailer and private employer announcing that it's boosting pay, handing out bonuses like so many other companies have announced since the tax cut deal. They're raising the starting rate for new hires to $11 an hour. And it is thanks, they say, to President Trump's tax bill. Charles Payne is host of Making Money on the Fox Business Network, and he joins me now. I mean, obviously, Walmart is huge news. I mean, one of the biggest, com biggest company in the country. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely huge news. It's the largest private employer and... You know, it's a company that, that has gotten a lot of grief over the years, you know, because, you know, they paid less, little money and, and things like that. But they have their own issues. You know, this is an Amazon world, and Walmart has been struggling to a degree also to compete in it. And they admit, management said, this happened strictly because of the new tax policies. And let me tell you, it wasn't just the higher minimum wage. It wasn't just the $1,000 bonuses. Maternity leave, paid maternity leave, paid parental leave. $5,000 bonus for folks who adopt people. I mean, think about these. These are issues that Americans love and embrace. And this is, these are progressive ideas, to be quite frank with you. Yeah, and they're sending a message because all of these actions they know are going to get a ton of headlines. So what's the message that these companies are sending to President Trump and to their employees as well? Well, they're sending to President Trump, thank you. Uh, you know, listen, we needed relief. We needed the help, particularly uh, retailers in America. They pay, for the most part, the highest taxes in this country. They weren't like the multinationals. They couldn't write it off. They couldn't make money overseas and That's stash it in, in a bank overseas. Yeah. They were the ones under the most pressure. So they sent the thank you to President Trump. And they also acknowledged, because President Trump put a lot of pressure on the business community, whether it was Boeing complaining about the cost of the uh, Air Force One or, or other companies, he let them know, I will shame you in front of everyone if you do the wrong thing. Listen, he's a profit-motivated person. He understands that. He but speaks their language. By the I mean, same no token, doubt about it. he speaks their language, but he also speaks the language yeah. of Main Street, and he's connecting those. What about this number from Quinnipiac? And, and there's a lot of other numbers in here that you know people say aren't, don't reflect well on the president. But I think when you ask someone, how do you feel about the economy, and 66% of them say excellent or good. And that was one of the only questions in this, this poll that didn't have some sort of political weight on right. it. That's an extraordinary number. It's so much. It's the biggest number, first of all, ever since they've been doing this ever. since 2001. And it's double what the average was for the last six or seven years. It's double that number. I tell you, even more impressive. That was a combination of excellent and good. Just take excellent, Martha. 
For Jan January, 18% of Americans said excellent. And in, in, in December, it was 11%. A year ago, 2%. It shows you just even more recently, in December, where we saw a record amount of uh, consumer purchases, people are spending. There's something going on beneath the surface that's not reflected in any political polls. We saw it in the numbers in December, and now we're seeing it in these sort of surveys. And you're right. All the other stuff, listen. When you set up a poll and you start asking because about it the... Because it said, just so people know, that, that they, people felt that it was because of President Obama and not so much right. because of President right. Trump. How do you explain that? Two things. Uh, first of all, the weighting of the poll. 30, 36% Republican, 38% Independent, only 23%, I'm sorry, Republican. So 23% of the... It's, it's a small, absurd number. But the questions leading into that also were sort of disingenuous. How fit is the president? How intelligent is the president? They were sort of Softening negative... the ground. Right, exactly. Yeah. So leading into that... But you cannot get around the fact that Americans are saying that this economy is on fire. Everyone admits that. Everyone's seeing it. And it is something I think it's Dow great. I think we also celebrate it. Today, the um, Dow of 200 points. It's a measure of future earnings and optimism in the country and in Absolutely. those companies. Thank it you. is. Thank it you, is. It's a, it's a great time. Thanks. So in the age of Internet bullying and body shaming, one brave woman takes on an Internet hater in a very unique way, and her response is going to make your day. Our own beloved Janice Dean. Stay on a plate for us. She's up next. <laughs> Love it. So bullying and body shaming, as we all know, are nothing new. But in the age of social media, the taunts and the insults are a bit more potent. They sting from time to time, hurled from anonymous haters, perhaps in their basement, in some unknown location, in their kitchen, wherever they are. What is worse, our society still hasn't figured out exactly how to handle them, and you certainly can't silence them, or maybe you can, until this story caught our eye today about one of our dear friends, one of my oldest friends at uh, Fox News. We started on day one together. We Janice did. and I were office mates. Um, so a viewer, a nasty person named Joanne, had the gall to write this. Dear Janice, please stop allowing Fox to dress you in those short skirts. They're not flattering on you. You're an attractive lady. Love your 80s hair, but your legs are distracting every time you walk on the screen. Joanne. Love Joanne. <laughs> How would you respond to that? Would you respond at all? Janice summed up the courage to write back. Hi, Joanne. Fox doesn't dress me. I get up like everyone else in America and put myself. my clothes on like we all do here in the morning. And I, I just ad-lib that. I'm sorry if you don't like my legs. I am grateful to have them to walk with. You're right. I don't look like the typical person on TV, and I'm proud to be a size 10. Imagine that. You can always turn the channel if you're offended by my huge legs, which they are not, which Janice wrote. Um, I hope you don't mind. I may share your post with everyone on my Facebook page. All the best, Janice. Here with me now, Fox News senior meteorologist, awesome person, and smart, terrific, courageous. We did so start together, ways. by the way. That's like a trivia question. And I we know. shared an office. Yeah, we did. I. We shared a little office with no window, interior. Um, and um, that's how we got our start. And here we are, still here today. And I'm so proud of you for what you said and did on this today. And we all get these kind of creepy things. But you know what? You, what you wrote about how important it is to you to be able to use your legs is mm -hmm. very personal for you. Well, I think that was the difference. Like, we all get the trolls, right? And yeah. whether or not we respond, I think most of us are just, okay, let it be out there and I'm not going to respond. But it was just that message and the fact that she was going after my legs, which I've always, you know, had a sore spot about. I've always wanted to be we a little bit We all have our thinner. thing. Right, of course. So women out there, men too, can identify with that. Sure. It was a sore spot, something that I got teased at uh, when I was in school. But the fact that I was diagnosed, and you know this, and the Fox family knows this, that I was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, over 10 years ago, I realized more than ever that I could lose my ability to walk at any given time. I have heard from MS patients who say they literally wake up one day and they try to get out of bed and they fall. So scary. Right? So I am potentially someone who might, that might happen to, and I might be in a wheelchair. And, and I'm okay with that. But to have someone go there and say your legs are unattractive or don't wear those skirts or don't show off your legs, it, 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 it hit me. The part also that really got to me was that I posted it on Facebook because I wanted to see what the how response many, how would many be. How many people follow you on Facebook so, that saw Joanne's <laughs> note? But my MS nurse, Jen, who was my very first uh, person who I really talked to about the disease, she wrote under Joanne's message, be proud of those strong legs. Be proud that you can walk and you can dance and you can jump and you can make snow angels and you've had two beautiful children that have helped you along the way. Be proud of those strong legs. And I thought, 
darn right, I'm, I'm proud of these strong legs. I'm proud of the fact that I'm a size 10 and I'm healthy and I have a wonderful family. And I'm sorry, Joanne, for whatever you're going through no, that no, you had to Joanne. write something like Joanne that. Joanne is no longer on social media. Well, you media know what, apparently. Martha, so 